Hello and welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, scientist, maker and massive engineering fan. In each episode, we'll be finding out how robots are pushing the boundaries of possibility and supporting businesses to make a more sustainable world. From the way we farm our food to how we package it, from 3D printing ocean waste into furniture to transforming cars into pieces of art, robotic technology is transforming our industries to reach an innovative and planet-friendly future. Today on the Robot Podcast, we're getting creative and exploring the world of art. Now, how on earth do robots and art go together? Well, in this episode, we're going to be finding out. We'll be chatting to Carrie Zoe, who has been an integral part of ABB's Pixel Paint project, an innovative solution to the problems in the automotive paint shop. Plus, our producer, Jack Cloramant, spoke to Advite Kalaka, one of the artists who has collaborated with ABB using this Pixel Paint technology, who, at just eight years old, has exhibited work from London to New York, making him one of the youngest artists worldwide. We'll also hear from Pindar Vanaman, an artist based in the US who uses robots and AI to help him create his pieces of art. But first, to give us an understanding of how the industry got to where it is today, I spoke to art historian Joe McLaughlin from Joe's Art History Podcast to find out how robots and art have been combined throughout history. Oh my goodness, since art was a thing, we've been using cutting edge technology. Artists are fabulous at embracing new sort of forward ways of thinking to help them sort of hone their craft and their skill. And it goes right back to people like Leonardo da Vinci, who really was sort of the godfather of, you know, polymaths. He was an artist, he was a scientist, he was an inventor. He would use something very similar to protractor to sort of help sort of mark out his lines and use sort of mathematical understandings and tools to help gain sort of perception in his work and depth and beauty. And just, yeah, he was just so, so fascinating. And then if you move forward to even someone like Vermeer, who is, you know, a 17th century Dutch artist, he used to use the camera obscura to help gain perception in his works. And then take it up to modern days, someone, David Hockney, for example, an iconic British artist who's in his 80s and has started playing around with iPad drawings and had a huge retrospective at the Royal Academy of Arts three years ago. You know, technology is and technologically developments are at the core of art history. You can't have one without the other. That's absolutely brilliant and fascinating in equal measure, not only because of how cutting edge technology has changed throughout the years, but also these artists being not just the early adopters of this technology, but actually the developers, the forerunners with it. But I want to hone in a little bit, Joe, on two robots and robots being depicted in art. And I know a little bit about this, but could you give us a bit of a history lesson on that? The earliest depiction that we have of a robot is, once again, the godfather himself, Mr. Leonardo da Vinci. There is a recording of in one of his sketchbooks that was dated 1495, where he is essentially sketching out the idea of the first ever robot and what that would look like. And it's a mechanical suit of armor that can move and can sort of lift up its visor. And it's incredibly fascinating. And he also built it. And essentially inside, it's a series of pulleys and chains that make this robot work. And it's just unbelievably mind boggling that this was even a thing that he could think of this. But really, the first time we see robotics coming into art history is sort of the 1950s. And there's an artist called Nicholas Schoffer, and he's one of the first artists ever to use sort of robots and mechanics within art history. And he developed a sculpture called CYPS1. And what this did, it was it was an AI programmed sculpture which reacted to light and sound and movement and it would interact with its viewer and it kind of blew people's minds as it would. It was one, it was the first time anyone had ever really seen anything like this. But something really exciting that's happened in 2019 in Oxford, Aidan Miller, who is a gallerist and an art historian, he was toying with the idea of what's next for the future of art and art history. 
and the idea of technology and AI, he couldn't really escape from it. So he's developed a robot called Ada. And Ada is the first artificial intelligent robot artist. And what you can do with Ada is you can sit in front of her and she sort of, she's programmed through algorithms and she has cameras in her eyes that sort of essentially scan the sitter. And within an hour, with the help of a robotic hand, can paint much like the impressionists a portrait of you in under an hour and it's really good it's really convincing if you gave me and Ada the same sort of task Ada would come out on top every single time I'm no artist myself I'm just I'm an, a great admirer <laughs> That was Joe McLaughlin there, and it just goes to show how hand in hand art and cutting edge technology and robots have been throughout history and how we've got to where we are today. But where are we heading in the future? Well, one industry that is turning to a rather creative solution is the automotive industry. And this is where ABB's pixel paint technology is coming in to help tackle a huge problem that is found in the paint shop. From wasted materials to wasted time, there's a lot that can be improved when it comes to painting cars. And of course, robots can provide a way to make the process more efficient without skipping out on that old creativity. I spoke to Carrie Zoe, Global Product Manager for Paint at ABB, to find out more. The Pixel Paint is a very innovative solution from ABB, and we can use it for painting automotive vehicles. This the Pixel Paint incorporates a high DPI painting ink jack head which is quite similar as our printer in office. We are able to spray the two-tone, like the, you know, the contrast color on the car and a decorative painting and application on the car. Speaking of the two-tone, I think you can easily find these uh, examples from streets, like the black roof or yellow roof, and uh, at the same time, and the other color on the car body. So that is something we see a lot from streets. Uh, but for the decorative painting, I think that is the most creative and interesting part, which we can use a lot of our imagination to personalize whatever you want to put on the car. Exactly. So what you're saying is the pixel paint. So it's basically like a, a painting robot arm, I suppose. And you said it's got a high DPI. So that's dot per inch, I'm guessing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so that means you can just be more precise with your painting. So it basically, it's got smaller pixels, I suppose, if we think about it as like a, a screen. Yeah. Gosh, that means, yes, you can do so much more accurate painting onto these cars and other vehicles. So, Carrie, I described it as a robot arm, but is it a robot arm? Like, what would it look like? What does it look like? Ah, well, I think it's quite, um, it's the same as we can see. And the other robots working in the workshop, but and there is some difference between them. If you go into the paint shop, you can see this painting robot and holding the applicator and spray the color on the car. And you can see this paint mist is around this applicator. And with the pixel paint, when you see it in a paint shop, you see the robot, of course, plus the print head on the robot wrist. But when we are doing the spraying, you don't see any paint mist around it. So I think that is the biggest difference between the current painting and the pixel paint. But speaking of the pixel paint technology itself, of course, before we are uh, doing the painting, we need to import the image, whatever you want to put on the car, into our software, and then put the image in on the CAD model to make sure and that they're in the right place and the right uh, area you want to put it and then preview it and then confirm it. So that means once the robots and they start to paint and everything is running by themselves, no people intervention at all. That makes complete sense. So yeah, of course, just like when you're printing something, you have to get it on your computer, but because yeah. you're printing 3D, you have to make sure that trajectories are all gonna work on that 3D object. Yeah. And then basically you press print. And in my head, it's a bit like the difference between using a spray can and using a pen. Yeah. And using a pen, you can be so much more precise 
than using a spray can. And that seems to be a bit like what you've described in terms of with no mist around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I suppose, are there any other problems that this technology overcomes? Yeah, so yes, you can be more precise, but does it lead to anything else, any more advantages? The accuracy is something we can ensure and we can provide the very high resolution image and to the car with a very good quality a very good appearance. That is the benefit we can get from the accuracy. But that is not only one of the benefits and uh, from the this technology. I think the biggest value is the sustainability and we can do or we can provide to the pen shop. With the current technology, uh, we only spray around 70 to 80 percent of the paint on the object and that means the remaining 20 to 30 percent as a waste and all this 20 to 30 percent paint will go into this recycling process that means a lot of the cost and also pollution with this the pixel paint we are able to eliminate this overspray that means we are able to attach or spray the paint on the object 100 percent no mist, no overspray, then of course, there's no need to go to any recycling or any pollution. And I think this is the second benefit and we can reduce the paint a lot. We can protect the environment and we can also reduce the emission. And I think besides the reduction of the paint, and we also reduced a lot of the material, you know, because the, when they are doing this, the two-tone painting in their production line, they have to do this masking process. That means, um, for example, if we need to spray the black roof, and then we need to we need to spray the first color, like the first layer, like the white, and then when we finish that, we need to mask the white area, and then expose the, the, the roof, and then we spray the black color on the roof. And then after everything's finished, and we just remove all this masking uh, material. That's incredible. Just like when you're painting your walls and you want, you know, one next to it that's a different color, you've got to, yeah, you've got to mask off one to make sure there's no, there's no spill of the color, yeah. no leak of the color onto it. Yeah. So what you're saying is that, so pixel paint does one color at a time, but because there's none of this overspray, you just don't need to protect the other colors from the one that you're doing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We are helping the paint shop to be greener in the future. The pen shop is consuming more than 65% of the energy in the whole automotive manufacturing process. So it's a monster to consume the energy. Isn't it just? I would not have thought that at all. Yeah, if we are able to help the pen shop to reduce the energy, um, I think this is the, something we want This our ultimate goal and to make the pen shop greener. I think the second sentence is, con is concerning the labor shortage. And to do this masking process, we need uh, around 20 persons per shift. So that means if one factory, they have two shifts per day, and they are going to need 40 persons to do this masking and the demasking per day. It is the, not only the cost of the labor, but also not so healthy. All this the paint is including a solvent. Doesn't matter the waterborne or solvent bond. But it's not, it is not so um, people friendly, I would say. When you are working inside of the booth and, or even away from the booth, then it is still some smell and you can feel it. So if we are able to uh, use robots to do this work instead of the human, then that means that we can just make the people safer. We want to um, protect the people more inside of the pen shop because the pen shop is not really not so friendly for people to work inside. Time and time again, we hear about robots improving efficiency, safety and sustainability and pixel paint there proving once again this can be delivered. It's an absolutely fascinating bit of technology that, in my opinion, will surely revolutionise the automotive industry. But excitingly, AVB has gone one step further with their pixel paint technology and has collaborated with two world-renowned artists to create the world's first art 
car. <laughs> yes, you heard that right. It's brilliant. Now, these two artists are eight-year-old child prodigy Advite Kalaka and Dubai-based digital design collective Illusar. Now, they both created their own designs, but thanks to ABB's pixel paint technology, Advite's swirling sort of monochromatic design, as well as Illusar, it was a tricolor geometrical pattern, have been perfectly transferred onto their unique car canvases, I suppose. And we were lucky enough to get an interview with Advite. Now, he's the winner of the 2020 Global Child Prodigy Award, and he started painting before he had even turned one. He's since appeared on Disney and exhibited all over the world, with a show at New York's Art Expo, a solo stint in Canada, and most recently, a solo show in London's Galliardi Gallery. Our producer, Jack Claremont, went to speak with him about the project and Advite explained how he felt when he saw the robot painting his artwork. I felt really excited. The robot was really sleek and efficient and it painted my artwork beautifully. The robot was like a huge arm. I saw it in a BB factory. When you paint, what do you like to think of? I'm inspired by dinosaurs, galaxies, the infinite universe, my everyday experiences, nature and science and technology. When did you first start painting? I started painting when I was eight months old. Once I saw my sister painting a picture for a friend, I crawled towards her and took, grabbed the colours and brushes and started painting on the floor. My parents saw that what I was doing and I was creating beautiful compositions. So they gave me a canvas and colors. So I created my first painting on canvas when I couldn't even walk or talk. My favorite color is black. I like black because when I was a baby, black was the only color I used to ask when I wanted to paint. And if we mix all the colors, it creates black. And so that was good then that you're painting for the car. You chose black. Makes sense. How long did it take you to paint the painting for the car? Mm, It took me something like 15 minutes. Would you like to work with a robot again? Yeah. Yeah. If you could think of anything that you could paint with a robot, what would you paint? Uh, a house. Well, I would certainly love to see a house being painted by a robot. So I really do hope that Advite's wish comes true. Um, but Jack also got to speak with Advite's mother, Shruti, about the project, who offered us insight into how it all first came about. We were approached by ABB for this project. And it was such an incredible feeling uh, when they came up with an idea that they wanted to collaborate with Adved. It is the first art car painted by a robot, which is happening for the first time ever. Uh, We feel uh, it's a revolution and we are grateful that Adved's art is uh, a part of this project. When Adved was informed about this project, he was very excited and I remember he was jumping with joy. He was so excited to use uh, black paint because it's his favorite color and he just loved the idea that that painting is going to be only in black color because he loved the boldness of black. Usually he paints spontaneously, so it was a similar kind of reaction. Uh, He picked up canvas colors and he just went on spontaneously. And he started seeing images, forms, He tells a story about the painting that he saw images of Pegasus flying and there were zebra Pegasus who were prancing in in a perfect garden. So he named the painting as Zebra Utopia. With the actual painting itself from the robot, is he happy with how that looked in terms of how the robot has managed to do his painting? Advit was really excited to see the robot painting his artwork. It was not just any artwork, it was his artwork, which is happening for the first time ever. He felt a connection with the robot and he felt that the robot was interacting with him. How long did it take to do the painting, do you know? 
I think robot took only 30 minutes to complete that artwork, which is very efficient. And uh, we love the fact that it doesn't have any wastage of color. It's so sleek and efficient. It's amazing. So ABB's art car project shows us that a robot, yes, it can paint an artistic design onto this car canvas, but can robots have their own artistic process? Can robots be creative? Can can we call them artists at all? Now, this is all rather controversial. I completely understand that. But I took my questions to Pindar Van Arman, who is an artist based in Washington, who uses robotics and AI to help him create his work. And Pindar began by telling me why he started using robotics in the first place. I'm an artist, an interesting kind of artist. uh, But even though it's getting more and more common these days, uh, I've been using robots to paint for about 20 years. I've painted all my life, and then I had a, a family. I started a family, and I was out of time, and I just had this idea, like, wouldn't it be neat if robots could do most of a painting for me and I could just come paint after the kids were asleep and finish up a painting? So um, this was started about 20 years ago, just to have a little quick assistant in the studio, and um, it's picked up as I've added more and more artificial intelligence Every year I'd add something and every year I'd redo headlines about the new things AI could do. And it's it's gone to be quite an autonomous robot. And here's where I say I get a lot of hate mail. So here's what I say. It is not an artist. It's a robot that paints using a lot of AI. And so the claim that I make that's controversial is that it is creative. It's absolutely a creative machine. This sounds amazing, Pindar. And in terms of the process of how that happens, can we take a few steps back and you just sort of chat me through the process of creating art with AI? For anyone that's familiar with AI, the the most popular thing happening right now, or there's two things, generative adversarial networks where you show AI a bunch of photos of celebrities, for example, and then the AI will create a new celebrity studying the patterns of what a celebrity looks like. And then the other one is these these text prompts where you can give AI a text prompt and the AI will return a picture of what you've asked it for. Some amazing stuff happened. Like it's so realistic. You just wonder, did someone prompt, you know, did someone stage this? So those are the big things happening in AI. Mine's a little different to take a step back. Mine goes way back. And the process I have is not to do specific AI tasks, but to actually create or make a creative system and, and I try and model it on how humans create. In, in all my studies, what I've realized when I sit in front of a canvas, probably 20 different parts of me are fighting over what to do on that canvas. And so I've tried to systematically find those different parts of me and make a program for each of them. Okay, so imagine right now I have 24 algorithms running and then I let the robot loose. So the first thing the robot does is it starts with an image that it wants to paint. And then, it, and then it actually takes a picture of the canvas. And then the robot will ask itself, how can I make this canvas look more like this image that I want to paint? And it might plan some simple strokes or it might plan a complex set of strokes. That's the society of mind fighting. And then it makes some strokes. After about 100 strokes, um, it'll take another photo of the canvas. And once again, it'll ask itself, how is it doing? How much does this canvas look like the image in my mind? And it'll make another set of strokes. That basic part is based on how um, artist Paul Clay once talked about the creative feedback loop. It's, you know, an artist makes a mark on the canvas, takes a step back, sees how the canvas is going, makes another mark. That by itself can complete a painting, but that's that would be a really simple photo reproduction, or I wouldn't say photo reproduction, but a reproduction of an image. The next thing it does is every so often when it takes a photo, some of the creative agents look for, is there something in there that's interesting? Like, do I see eyes? And then the robot starts doing creative things like looking for ways to make the painting look more interesting, to add contrast, to put complementary colors next to each other. And so from start to finish, this robot is taking photos every hundred or so strokes. And then 24 algorithms are fighting over how to do the next set of strokes. And it just becomes this ridiculously complex, evolving, generative piece of art. But the programming is something that you've totally done yourself. So can you explain a little bit about uh, the AI that you've used in these machines? In the beginning, it was very simple. It was like, it was basically like a printer driver. It's like, you know, here is a GIF image, you know, scan it. And where, you know, 
wherever you see a specific color, go pick up the paint and, and put it on the canvas. So the most basic thing is it gives the robot X, Y coordinates, and it just does a bunch of connecting of the dots. Now inside its mind, it gets much more complicated. Like I was saying, it's like every hundred or so strokes, it takes a picture and then gets sent a hundred or so or more, stro more strokes to make. And these can be any number of colors. Some of the algorithms are as simple as just checking the contrast across the whole painting and, and noticing that one part doesn't have good contrast to another is checking the color balance of the entire painting. And it might say, you know, colors are very vibrant and, and spread out everywhere except this one spot. Let's go fix that. Those two algorithms will raise small red flags saying, hey, this needs to be done. And, and this is how important I think this should be done. But then other algorithms get way more complex. Some of them are generative adversarial networks. Some of them are style transfers. And they actually go into stylistic. It might come to a point where the robot takes a snapshot and then sees a face and then notices that the face is lopsided and decides, you know, does a quick style transfer and says, hey, you know, I can actually use AI to improve this face and, and add a, a style from a previous painting to this area, which will make it look more interesting. I can change the composition up so that the composition is more balanced or even more complex with generative adversarial networks. It can, it can do something like say, hey, you know, the face needs improvement because it's just not looking like a good model. So I'm gonna go ahead and add another face to this part of the canvas. Those are the more advanced AI algorithms that actually change the composition and, and change what's getting painted. So it's everything from simple stuff, put some touch-ups here to make it look, look more like the image in my mind to a much more complicated AI algorithm that says, let's change this composition altogether because it's going in the wrong direction or because I don't see anything interesting happening here. And this goes right back to that artist Paul Clay is that creative feedback loop. It's, you know, this robot makes marks on the canvas, takes a step back, looks at the marks and decides the effect they're having then makes the, the rest of the decisions. What an absolutely fascinating process. And I'm not an artist in any way, shape or form in terms of my, my skill, um, but I am creative. I write workshops and shows and the things that you were saying there, I could really reflect on There's There's things that you do intuitively, but because I'm an engineer and a scientist, I break these down and trying to look at them logically. And it's, it's sort of breaking down that X factor into a logical steps, which you might think takes the creativity out of it, but in a way it makes the creativity easier because you can see the steps of how to get to something that is beautiful, is something that you want to create. Yeah. And, and you know, it's also made me realize that, you know, whether or not artists realize it or not, we all have a creative process and that creative process is a generative algorithm. And, and the example I love to use is Pollock. Jackson Pollock had a very simple algorithm. He would drip in one series. He would start by dripping black paint until it was evenly across the whole canvas. Then he would drip white paint. Then he'd go back to dripping black paint then back to white paint. And then he would do it until the whole canvas had even distribution of this paint. And there's even been there's even been this Pollock bot which would imitate that. And uh, whether he realized it or not, that was a generative algorithm that he followed, a creative process. And a lot of art, and that's a simple one uh, for for Jackson Pollock. You know, there's a spectrum of how complicated our creative processes are, but they're all processes. And what's interesting about an artist is when an artist gets big, it's usually because that artist has a look, and people like that look, and that artist repeats the look a lot. And that is definitely what this robot is doing. It's, you know, it's developing a look and it's repeating that look a lot and it's following a process to do it. Pindav and Armand there really opening my eyes up to this, this collaboration between automation, AI and technology and the art world and them not being in different camps, but actually being uh, collaborative in the very sense of the word and in a way that's what's really surprised me about this episode is the fact that technology and the art industry do go hand in hand but unfortunately that is it for this week a massive thank you to Carrie Zoe, Joe McLaughlin, Advit and Shruti Kalaka and Pindar Vanaman. Next week we tackle one of my favourite subjects Food. We track the journey ambials take from farm to fork and of course discover how robotics are helping those processes along the way. 
I'm Fran Scott, and the Robot Podcast is a Fresh Air production for ABB. If you want to find out more about robotics at ABB, there's a link in the show notes. And remember to follow or subscribe now for free wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Part of the ABB Decoded series. 